I want to start with a little, a little prayer in Tibetan. It's just, but it's uh, a lot of the prayers in, in, in Buddhism are really just aspirations, or we might call positive thinking. You know, aspirations. May all beings be happy. May this. May that. Blah blah. So this, it's got two parts. This prayer. The first two are for anybody in the room who already identifies with being a Buddhist. It's kind of reminding us of our reliance on the Buddha and his teachings. And the second part is really just stating an altruistic reason for our being together to listen uh, to these words, to hear it as advice. It's all advice. You might have to take. You don't have to take it. Buddha's not a creator, so he's not kind of. We don't, we're not forced to believe anything. You know, I always say we're the boss, not Buddha. So it is advice. But if you choose to use it, that's your business, right? So to hear it as advice, and advice what for? Well, really simply, to help us develop what for the Buddha, he has found from his own experience, is the quite phenomenal potential that we all possess. To be less neurotic, less depressed, less fearful, more kind, more wise, more useful. Speaking very simply. Um, that's thinking, this prayer is expressing that thought. This is why we're here. Take, yeah, for our sake and the sake of others, basically. Sangi Chodam, Soke Chodam, La Jam Shu, Badu Dagni Kapsuchi, Dagi Chon Yen Gipa Sonam Ki, Drola Penchi, Sangi Drupacho, Sangi Chodam, Soke Chodam, La Jam Shu, Badu Dagni Kapsuchi, Dagi Chon Yen Gipa Sonam Ki, Drola penche sangge drupa shok sangge charam soke chognam la chang chu badu dagni kyap suchi dagi chan yen gi pa sonam ki drola penche sangge drupa shok Okay, so So this person called Buddha, you know, he lived, you know, as we know, he was Indian. But often what we don't know in our, especially in our Judeo-Christian culture, us white people, basically, you know, <laughs> we, we don't know anything about India, nothing about Indian philosophy, nothing about Indian psychology. Therefore, we, know, we, we do not know that there's this astonishing system that existed even before the Buddha. I remember with the Dalai Lama fairly recently, and I always quote this, saying it was these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. So Buddha came out of an incredible tradition, you know, these great thinkers, yogis, brilliant philosophers, and then diverged in his own direction, in particular in relation to his own findings about the nature of self. And then, of course, because he's not a creator, and he doesn't assert a creator, there's no concept like that in Buddhism, therefore, you know, there's no punishment and reward, which is how, of course, we hear religion. It's all kind of, you know, punishment and reward. And we think of karma as like a big stick you use to, someone used to beat you. But I mean, there's no, if there's no creator, there's no punishment and there's no reward because there's no punisher and no rewarder. So really to hear the Buddhist teachings is not that easy for us because we bring that whole model with us. And, you know, and don't blame your Jewish mother or your Catholic mother because the Buddha would say this dualistic view of good, bad, punishment, reward, guilt and all this nonsense is very much a function of ego deep in our bones, you know. So anyway, the, the advice of the Buddha, you could say that one way of presenting the whole of Buddhism, it really is a system of ethics. Absolutely that. It is definitely an, another way of presenting, another doorway into it. It is absolutely a method for stopping suffering and getting happiness. And it's definitely a method for stopping ignorance and getting wisdom. And in reality, they all come to the same thing. So we mightn't worry about, we mightn't be so excited about getting wisdom, but we all know we want happiness. I'm not sure about ethics, but we all want happiness and don't want suffering. <laughs> so let's look at it from that perspective, you know, because all, all of these have to come together. And I think one of the points that's very interesting about our culture, you know, these days, I mean, all these amazing conversations that Dalai Lama and many of the great Tibetan Buddhist yogis and scholars have been having with the best brains in the West, which is the basis of a lot of the findings now, as we know, you know, for example, neuroplasticity is coming from these amazing conversations these last 30 years by, you know, seeing that even thinking about compassion can reconfigure the brain, you know, which is fantastic that we now, two and a half thousand years later, are proving Buddha's point that you're not stuck with the mind you're born with which is really marvellous, you know. So, um, okay, so that, but, but one of the interesting points, we hear a lot about science and, and physics and, you know, and, it's, it's, and we look into the teachings about emptiness and we're saying that we're beginning to see this with science. But still there's one major point that's very interesting. You know, you think about wisdom. 
We can think of genius people in our culture who are brilliant scientists, brilliant mathematicians, brilliant IT people, but they still go home and beat up their husband. So there's, it's meant to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like a comedian. But anyway, the point is, we don't think of wisdom anything to do with. You can be completely neurotic, but because you're wise, we kind of forgive you. But for the Buddha, wisdom and, 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 and ethics and virtue completely come together. You couldn't possibly have one without the other. So it's a really interesting kind of wisdom, you know. But don't think of it as holy wisdom. It's very on the ground, very very practical. So what is the essence of really what the Buddha's point is? It's about the mind, you know, and that's often a surprise to us. We think it's spiritual. We think of a soul or a spirit. But he, again, he doesn't, uh, doesn't posit such a thing like that. He uses the word mind. He uses the word consciousness. And what he means by that is what we would, you know, it's, the enti- it's covering. These words are used in Buddhism to cover the entire spectrum of our inner being. Anything from thoughts to feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious, instinct, intuition, this entire spectrum of what goes on inside us. This is what Buddha refers to as our mind or our consciousness. These words are used virtually synonymously. So he would say that our mind has these much more subtle levels of cognition that, that, that don't depend upon a brain. And that's, of course, why we think it's mystical. But this is what Buddha, the Buddha and the Hindus before him, they're the ones who invented this technique that the world vaguely knows now as mindfulness meditation. They're the genius who created this, these, these brilliant thinkers and scholars who are enabled, who, who are now, this, this technique is actually a, a psychological skill, using our modern words, that enables you to completely subdue the grosser level of your, of your of the crazy conceptual thoughts and all the crazy sens- sensory, thought, sensory, sensory consciousness, which is all we're familiar with. And it enables you to completely go beyond that to access this more subtle level of your own mind, the actual, co- this subtle level of cognition. It's like accessing the microscope of your mind. And of course it sounds abstract to us, because we do not, in our modern psychology, in our modern neuroscience, we do not posit anything remotely like that, because we think about the brain. We only talk about the brain. Well, these days we need more things. It's marvellous. But there we, Buddha, fundamental point to the Buddha, again, coming from these Indians before him, mind has this more subtle level. And in the long term, to accomplish the goal of, uh, of ridding, from, Buddha's fundamental point is that, we, that the stuff in us that we call, delu- you know, that we call uh, fears and anger and jealousy, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, all this stuff, you know, you know, this stuff, these simple words, and what we call in more modern psychology, psychosis and neuroses and all this. This stuff, as far as Buddha's concerned, this is, and this is the crucial point, this is the fundamental point that is unique in the Buddhist approach. He has found from his own direct experience, from his own hard work doing this job at a subtle level of his own mind, that this stuff is not at the core of our being. This stuff is adventitious. This stuff is not integral to who we are. Now, this is very hard to hear if we just take all my, our psychological models, you know. I mean, some of you might be a therapist, and I come to you and I say, please give me methods to get rid of all ego, all fears, all neuroses, all jealousy, all depression, all the time, not just random. You will really think I'm seriously mentally ill, and I'm quite serious, because we don't have anything remotely, we don't posit any possibility like that, which of course is why we call it religion. And when as soon as it's religion, you can say what you like, and do what you like, and believe what you like. And that's kind of insulting. I mean, the, the, the rigor and clarity and depth of analysis that we know we need to employ just to make a cake, forget about being a physicist, is exactly what we need to do to be one of these yogis, to, be, to do clarity and rigor and, 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 and understand and unpack and unravel this mind of ours in the way the Indians did and the, and the thousands of years that the Buddhists have been doing and the people are doing right now up in the mountains or in the forests right this minute, not just spacing out being hippy trippy, but un- <laughs> unpacking and unraveling the contents of their mind in order to discover this astonishing potential. That's the meaning of the word nirvana, you know. It's not some place like heaven or some place you, you, you go where, you, you know, where you've given up samsara, where you're allowed to have sex and drugs, you've got to go to some boring old place called nirvana, all these cliche views we have. They're states of mind, you know. Samsara is a state of mind that's been caught up in these neuroses, believing this is who I really am. And nirvana is also, speaking simply, is when you've cut the rubbish, you've cut the nonsense, and you have freed yourself from it, quite literally. This is what Buddha's saying, psychologically, is what the potential of life being is. So that's quite intense, that's quite radical. Speaking psychologically, quite radical, you know. So let's look at that. Let's look at it. <coughs> so the Buddhist, the way to understand this, of course, is to look at the Buddhist model of the mind. 
it's extremely, I mean, if you read some of the texts, the commentaries, coming right back to the time of the Buddha, coming previously but back before that from, from the Indians, the Hindus, you know, the commentaries on the mind, <coughs> the internal process, not the brain, the internal process. You ask these dudes back then where their brain was, they would not have a clue. They've never heard of such a thing, but they know their mind, baby. And this is not a cliche, it's literally true, because the Buddha would assert that your consciousness, your cognitive process, is not itself the brain. This is why he can assert subtler levels. One needs to look into this seriously, because it's quite a shock to us, because of our assumptions. But it's, it's very rigorous in all the literature. It's astonishing. It's remarkable, actually. And I'm sure modern scientists will be delighted to study it. Except they have to posit the possibility of not talking about the brain. So, you know, and it's like consulting it to think it's you close your eyes and cross your fingers and some magical thing happens, which is one of the cliche views we have about meditation. Not like that at all. So, okay, but look at the Buddhist model of mind coming from these Indians, you know. There's one way of presenting it is uh, in, we have, we have, we have, you study the epistemological model of the mind, which is it's so utterly fascinating, the way the mind functions. And then you have the psychological model, which we're going to go into. But just before we do that, I want to just touch upon one point in the epistemological model, which really points to one of the, the powerful ways that Buddha's talking. I have to stand up now. So, in the epistemological model, we learn about how we have sensory consciousness and how we have mental consciousness. So, Lama Yeshi, one of my teachers, says, we make, in our culture, we make the body the boss. It's true. We, we determine all our, virtually most of our experiences of happiness and suffering based upon the sensory experiences. We give huge more power than, than, than they are worth to the senses, according to the Buddhist view. This, this is a really telling point I want to make on insights. Let me just say, you know, this cup. I wouldn't say this, but let's just pretend I would. If you see me, if my eyes are open and I turn here and I look at this object, I'd say, oh, wow, what a pretty cup. I wouldn't say that, but pretend I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, for that matter, what an ugly cup. I don't want to be rude to restore restores. I don't want to be rude to the people. Never mind. So let's just pretend I say it's a pretty cup. Not one of us in this room would doubt for one second that my eyes are seeing a pretty cup. The Buddha says, excuse me, don't be ridiculous. So the sensory consciousness for the Buddha, and let me spell it out, consciousness for the Buddha, he's not referring to the physical. We've got body and we have mind. These are two distinct phenomena. They're inextricably, inextricably linked, but they're not the same phenomenon. So I consciousness is that part of your mind that functions through the medium of a decent eyeball, the eyelid open, all the nerves working properly, that has a cognition. And the fact is, I, all the senses are like, with respect to dumb animals, are like dumb animals. They, they, don't, they can't cognize very much. So the objects of eye consciousness are merely shape and color. That's all it has the capacity to cognize. If I would hear one trumpet note, I'd go, wow, Miles Davis, I'd bliss out. My ear consciousness does not have that capacity. It hears sound. So you've got to ask yourself the very obvious question, where does the, the where does, what part of my mind is cognizing a pretty cup? And this is the point now. This is your mental consciousness. And as Lama Zoka puts it, one of my teachers, that's where the workshop is. Tibetans point here for the mind, okay? That's where the workshop is. The Buddha's view about the mind, one Lama said, it's like we're shooting a movie all day. Nothing goes astray. Everything gets stored, whether we're aware or not. Everything is retained in our memory. And of course, we might have heard Buddha talks about previous lives. So there's an awful lot, of, you know, he, Buddha's view of memory or unconscious is, leaves, leaves Jung for dead, I promise. Mm -hmm. There's millions of imprints in our mind, just sort of latent there. So, the, the, so what happens is this, when my eyes go here, what happens is this, and I'm, I'm in this seriously, quicker than Google, what happens is I access my mental consciousness or my memories, the, the few that I can retain from this life, what I think are pretty, what I, th I know it's a cup, I know it's this, I see it's blue, I see all the different things. Quicker than Google, really so incredibly quickly, up comes this, this opinion, and this is what I'm getting to here, an opinion. What a pretty cup. So basically, Buddha's saying that, that, our, concept, that our, our mental consciousness, the grosser level we live at in our mental consciousness, is at the level of conceptuality. And we're going to go into this. 
we have subtle levels of, of and mental consciousness, and we can only access those when we have very serious meditation. But we go beyond the grosser level and access these more subtle levels of our mind, which we finally need to do to unpack and unravel the nonsense to achieve this goal that Buddha says is natural and everyone can do. But you, you can't do it at the grosser level. You've got to go to the subtle level. And that's where we go beyond conceptuality, which is a bit abstract for us. But basically, in our daily life, we live at a, a level of conceptuality, but that includes all our emotions. So I'm going to go into this. So we live at a level of conceptuality, which means everything in our mind, everything we say and think and do throughout the day is a bunch of opinions. Now, there's a big surprise to us, because we might agree that it's an opinion, but, you know, if I say, oh, I can't stand Americans, I don't think it's an opinion. I think it's truth. <laughs> you know my point? Whatever comes out of our mouth, and this is the way Buddha says we suffer mightily, and we can see this when people are fundamentalists in their viewpoints. It's a viewpoint, you know? Pink people, blue people, this one, that one. We all walk around with our intense opinions, viewpoints about things, but because they're very, we, we have a very strong grasp on them, we're very attached to our views, we never think for one second of the viewpoint. We think it's an opinion, and we think we're right. And this is not just a few fundamentalists. Buddha says this is what being samsaric means. So, the, the, so we run around with these layers upon, Buddha says layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of, of opinions about things. So now, if we look into the Buddhist model of the mental consciousness, forget the sensory now, we're going to see we have three categories of states of mind. There's no fourth. And this is deceptively simple. We don't talk like that in modern psychology. We've got, the first lot we've got are like the, the fear-based, ego-based, ridiculous, neurotic, distorted, delusional, disturbing, misconceptions, wrong conceptual stories, ridiculous states of mind that have no basis in reality, and this is a curious way to talk about, and, and, and we'll go into these. Then we have the second category of states of mind, which are valid, reasonable. They're also opinions, but they're valid opinions. They're in sync with reality. And this is very much the wisdom approach in Buddhism, and it's massive. So what are some of those? So the first lot, what are some of those? Anger, attachment, jealousy, ego grasping, depression, anxiety, you name it. Stuff we're intimately familiar with that we in our culture, psychologically and our neuroscientific models, assume are, are who we really are, are at the core of our being. We give equal status to these as normal parts of a normal person. And we, we give them equal status along with the, the next category of states of mind, which the Buddha would call the positive states of mind, these simplistic labels. What are they? Love, empathy, intelligence, compassion, kindness, forgiveness, generosity. We know these states of mind. We know both, lots. And we know just in, 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 intuitively we know the first lot are miserable and the second lot are nice. Whether they're inside you or whether you're on the receiving end. We kind of know this, but we give, we give equal status to all of them. So like I said, if you're a therapist and I said, please give me methods to get rid of all the first lot, you think I'm ridiculous. In fact, it's true. We are so used to thinking a normal person has some anger, some jealousy, some kindness, some love. Hopefully more of the second lot. We kind of cross our fingers. But there's no view in our psychology and no view in our neuroscience that suggests that this first stuff are not at the core of our being and we can get rid of. It really is quite hard to conceptualise that. When we first hear it, we try to imagine a person who has no fear. No anger, no annoyance, no irritation, no frustration, no attachment, no jealousy. They just sound like a boring person. Right? <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> so we so take them for granted. And it sounds then, and then we hear, you know, and then because we conflate those along with the good ones, that's where we get into our love and compassion, love and attachment, we so conflate those two as, you know, we conflate them, see them as the same, that when we hear, but as Lama Zopa says, when we hear that Buddha says, sorry guys, you can't get happy until you give up attachment, we'll go, oh, I've got to give up my heart, I've got to give up my happiness. No, our, con our, our conceptions about it are wrong. So to even hear clearly what Buddha means, the Buddhist psychological model, which we don't tend to do, is, is really not that easy because his view is quite radically different. Quite radically different. So let's try and describe the difference from the Buddhist perspective, okay? So let's take attachment and anger, these two, attachment and love. So in the first lot, the neurotic ones, and he would have, you know, I joke about us, us white Jews and, the Jews aren't really white, you came back from the Arabs, didn't you? Aren't <laughs> the Jews in the Arabs, same family? Talk to me, people. <laughs> anyway, nobody's going to talk to me, all right, don't. <laughs> but 
I mean, it's true. <laughs> Except now that if you're European, you're more white, isn't it? Like, I'm trying to be kind of communicative, you know? Laugh or boo at me or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have to be brave enough to say what I want and never mind the response. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Excuse me. laughs> There's a comedian in England in the 1980s. If you're old like me, you're, if you're English, there's a comedian called Ronnie Corbett. Anybody heard of him? Yes. Okay. When I lived in London in the 80s, the number of people, even the taxi driver from 100 yards away, oh my God, I thought you were Ronnie Corbett, they said. <laughs> <laughs> Never, mind. Never mind. So anyway, where was I? Love and attachment. Okay. So in the first, in the first category of states of mind, Buddha articulates... 84,000 distinct mental illnesses, or as they politely call them in Sanskrit, klesha, which we politely refer, translate as uh, 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 what's the word? afflictions in English, which is an absurd word. Who uses afflictions? Nobody. But a very excellent term would be it's mental problems, problems of mental illness. So really, I'm not suck. Then we're all, as long as we have any attachment, any anger, any depression, any low self-esteem, etc., then we are mentally ill. And it's quite a, an excellent term. I think he would have liked it. We use all the Greek words, you know, like neurosis. He would have liked neurosis. Psychology, psych all, these, we, all our fancy words are Greek, you know, because they're the ones we go back to, not the Indians. So anyway, the first lot are the neurotic ones, the deluded ones. And it's very specific uh, uh, kind of definition. These are states of mind that are deeply disturbing, the very having of them, we are deeply disturbed. And they have a very specific function, and this is where the opinion business comes in, they have a very specific function of being delusional. So we know, and this is an excellent word in English, Buddha would have liked this, that we know if someone accuses us of being, delu us, us of being delusional, he's, they're accusing us of not being in touch with reality. And that's really quite seriously in the whole wisdom teachings is exactly how Buddha's talking. That to the degree that we have any of these neuroses, and I'm going to go into them, a particular attachment, that we are not in touch with reality. It's a very excellent way of putting it. So, the key factor, the key function of this first category, the unhappy ones, they're all these 84,000. He narrow, Luckily, he narrows them down to three. It's quite handy. So these three, <laughs> as you know, if you've read Buddhist literature, he calls them the three poisons. But, you know, maybe a more modern phrase would be the three toxic emotions. So the, the three of these, and they've got a very... They've got, there's a hierarchical relationship between them. The, the root one is really this, it's this, it's this whole business of self, ego. That, 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 um, there's this very deeply ingrained, deeply instinct, instinctive, fear-based, neurotic, mistaken sense of self, what is saying. It's primordially deep, and it's in the nature of fear. On the basis of this, Effectively, the main cause of our suffering in day-to-day -day life is this, is this one called attachment, which is such a shock to us because we, we use it in a positive way, you know, our, our definition of that word. That's not good. <coughs> and then on the basis of attachment, not getting what it wants, then that's, the third one is called aversion. So we can understand even this attachment and aversion. These words are so cute, you know. They're not like our, <laughs> our, they're not like our psychology, but they're very profound in the way Buddha describes them. So, we, so that the, when we begin to understand attachment, and aversion, we are really on track with understanding Buddha, and we're really therefore on track, if you're a Buddhist, in being a Buddhist, seriously a Buddhist. So what is attachment? Then in the second category, we've got the positive ones, love, empathy, compassion. We know these words. We know them well. So right now, effectively, in our, in our culture and in our, in our own hearts, the, this word attachment, we use, the way we use that word is like, it's like um, being close to somebody. She's got, much, she's got much attachment to her family. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfect. But we know that words have more than one definition. It's really important to remember that. Buddha's definition is absolutely not the one we use. So we have to, when we hear our definition, don't, that's not what he's saying. His is, this attachment, okay, what it is, it's, a, it's the main voice of this ego grasping. It's the main voice of this ego grasping. And the way to say ego grasping very loosely, having this, this deeply ingrained one, this primordial one, that when we cut it, that's, you've got, you've got your nirvana. It's this powerful, fear-based, deeply instinctive, you know, not articulated, you know, sense of a separate, bereft I. It's, it, then it gives rise to this. So naturally, because you feel separate from everything, this attachment is what arises. It's the main voice of it. And this, is, this attachment is multifaceted. And you're going to hear, you'll recognise different aspects, because we use a half a dozen different words for different states of mind, all of which, for the Buddha, are functions of this attachment. 
So the most primordial level of this attachment, and we're born with it, is this primordially deep feeling of dissatisfaction, never being enough. No matter what I get, not enough. What I do, not enough. What I achieve, not enough. How much my boyfriend tells me he loves me, not enough. No matter how much I achieve, not enough. How much weight I lose, not enough. How much I change this, not enough. I mean, hear it. We, it's like the half the glass, half full. This is kind of, this is the energy, this is the energy, the most primordial energetic level of attachment. And the Buddha says we come programmed into this life with it. And it's so primordial, we, we don't question whether it's valid. We just assume it's true. We just assume we're not enough. So of course if you're not enough, what are you going to do? You're going to hanker up to something out there. So why would it be out there? Because the second you wake up, you open your eyes, until the second you go to sleep, where is all our attention paid? Out there. Where life is, that's life. I'm this little lonely person here, and life is out there. That's what attachment job is. So the next level of attachment is this hankering, this emotional hunger for something out there, such that when I get it, it'll bring, it'll, 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 it'll you know, it'll, um, fill up the gaping hole. It'll make me satisfied, it'll bring me satisfaction. And this too is, all these levels of it, they're all, they're all the function of attachment. The aspects of attachment. It's, and it's just primordially deep inside us. Way beyond intellectual. Your mother doesn't teach you this. So the next function of attachment, of course, then is what, you know, you think of the thing, the cake, the, the person, the handbag, the job, the event, the whatever it might be. Attachment is limitless in its capacity to find something then the utter belief is, you know, that w this belief that when I get it, it'll make me happy, also does the other job of over-exaggerating its deliciousness. It's especially when it comes to the person. Over-exaggerates the function of that person to make me happy. And then comes this massive expectation, and that's control free. This massive manipulating and controlling to get the object, the person, and then the demand, the assumption that I will get happy, and that and the when it's a person, that it's their job to make me happy. And this is all just deeply ingrained. We don't articulate it this way, you know. It catches by enormous surprise. So to unpack and unravel and identify this is really what practice is. And it takes time, you know. So then, the, the millisecond, this attachment doesn't get what it wants. Because essentially, one brutal way of putting what attachment is, is this panic-stricken junkie in here that only can only wants the nice things. And of course, the nice things means and it sounds brutal. But if you don't want to think of yourself this way, think of people you really know who are mean and selfish and self-centered. You see exactly this. So luckily, our saving grace is our love and our empathy and compassion and patience and kindness. The less of this, the more little vampire we'd be. No question. But when you see people who are outrageously self-centered, it's because they can't access their love and their compassion and their kindness. Aren't we fortunate? The fact that we're even in this room, even thinking about these things, is unbelievably fortunate. You know, your coffee not the quite the right shape, but not, 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 not the right temperature, the person not the right words, the boyfriend not the right thing. There's a thousand things a day, no matter how much we try to think I'll get what I want, we know we can't and we don't. So what's that state of mind? That's called aversion. It's like this panic attack that arises when a chassis doesn't get what it wants. So there's a whole spectrum of that as well. And the obvious volatile level of aversion is called anger. You can see it, a person shouting and yelling, oh, she's just angry. Well, they're having a panic attack, basically. They're having a mental breakdown because their attachment didn't get what it wants. It sounds very brutal. And especially when it comes to things like justice and people suffering at the hands of brutal people, this sounds so shocking for words. Well, just, we won't go there yet. Just think of ordinary day-to-day -day life. You know? we, don't need to be, we don't need to be raped and murdered to, to have, you know, feel your rotten all day. This is the, the workings of this stuff at ever deeper levels, you know? So attachment, ego grasping, which gives rise to attachment, which gives rise to aversion. So then there's 
And this aversion has a whole spectrum. The most obvious volatile response would be what's called anger. Then you've got the mild aversion, and these are the killer because we don't notice these. We don't pay attention to these. Annoyance, irritated, upset, frustrated. A thousand times a day you're going to say that. But we don't pay attention, you know? We don't think it doesn't matter. But the Buddha's view is there's nothing we experience that goes astray. It doesn't go in one ear and out the other. We don't remember it, but it all gets stored here. It gets packed. We program ourselves with this stuff. So no wonder even just by the end of one day we're feeling anxious. We don't remember what to deal with. We forget it. <coughs> so, we, so Buddha's key thing, even without forgetting your nirvana, forget that long term, just having some semblance of awareness of what the hell is going on inside this mind of ours with a little bit of awareness you know using this practical skill that Buddha calls that we call vaguely mindfulness but there's so many methods of it made up these days all these bells and whistles <laughs> but basically it's a skillful it's a concentration technique to focus your mind even some semblance of this in the morning a little bit every day forget about nirvana this will for stepping out of your head for a few minutes every morning, you get into the habit of doing this, such that in the daytime, you're not just noticing the car, the boyfriend, the thing, and the food, you're also beginning to pay attention to the stuff raging on in here. We never pay attention until, this is my big point, we never pay attention to this stuff until, it, until it's roaring out the mouth. So when you're angry, you realize something's going wrong. Oh, I'm angry, what will I do about it? Well, it's a bit late, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit like, you know, really seriously, that's a bit like, you know, I use a dumb analogy, but it's kind of tasty. It's a bit like you're driving at 100 miles an hour and you, and, you, and you notice your wheels are falling off. And you've never heard of mechanics. You've never heard of wheels wobbling and you pay attention to there. We, we have no idea what's going on in our car because we don't pay attention. And you only pay attention when the, when the disaster happens. That's kind of insane, right? We, have, we, we pay attention to our bodies, our houses, our cars, everything, but not our mind. And this is not some cliche, this is deadly true. We wait until dramas happen, but it's just too late. So can you imagine even some semblance of understanding of what the hell is happening in here and dealing with it before it builds up, because stuff builds up, you know, by even near the one day. This is so practical. This is such practical stuff. We probably do this to some degree anyway. This is really what Buddha's on about, very simply. Get past all the labels of meditation, monks and nuns and this stuff. It's just practical, down to earth, becoming familiar with your own mind and learning to take control and own it. Own it and know that you can change it. It's not set in stone. And what level of mind are we talking about? Your concepts. So the trouble is, when you wait till the vomiting out the mouth, it's a bit late. It's a bit late to notice that that's a series of concepts, but it comes along with that massive emotion as well. And that's another way of putting this is, because we give such power to our bodies, we only notice what's going on in our mind when our body's involved, when you're shouting and yelling, isn't it? Or, or the, other, the other spectrum, you've got anger, the volatile level, irritated, annoyed, frustrated, upset, and the internalized level of aversion, despair and depression. So you either, Wait till you can't get out of bed one morning because you're now inert with depression to notice you've got some problem, or you want to kill somebody. I mean, these are both just simply too late. All Buddha's saying is we can learn to become familiar well, well, well before the disasters happen. That's the interesting, simple, down-to-earth, practical point. Don't make it holy, don't make it mystical, you know. It is just practical psychology. Because the Buddha's saying everything that goes on in our mind plays a role. Every single tiny thing in our mind. This is the business of karma. The simple meaning of karma is it's, it's the word action. And mental action is the key point, intention. So our mind is doing that. Even Western psychology says we've got a thousand thoughts a second. Buddha completely agrees. But we don't pay attention to the mind until, it's, until the body's involved, until it's emotion. And, that, and we give all that power to emotion. But it's, that's, that's, just the, that's just the tip of the iceberg. What's got, we've got to go more deep inside. And it's not mystical. It just takes time, that's all. It just takes time. So then we can begin to, to distinguish between, let's, let's say, the one of attachment and love. When it's raw attachment, you just don't become, you become familiar with that. But it's like I'm in love with somebody, you know? This is where the difficulty is. Whether it's your baby, whether it's your beloved friend, or whether it's your boyfriend, whatever, this is where it is really hard to try and see the difference. So because attachment is so de such a default mode for all of us, and unless you're a highly evolved being, you've got to have it, and it's going to be a while before it goes, don't hold your breath, you know, seriously. But love, we all know, we're very familiar. So how does Buddha define love? Well, you know, 
it's 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 the start. It's the basic. The basic definition of it is this: is the delight in someone else's happiness, or the thought, "May you be happy." That's love. It's empathetic. It's it's, it's altruistic necessarily. Compassion is the flip side. You see suffering, may you not have it. And then we grow those. They're, they're the basics, and we we know we we know we have these. So let's look at the loved one. You know, I have to have a man here. Well, I could have a girl these days, or, or, or we could be anything. But these days, we'd be very flexible, can't we? Who we can love. <laughs> I can't see anybody. I can't see any boys. Any boys? There's a boy. Are you a boy? This is right. Oh, you're a boy too. So I'll have this one first. So look in. You're a boy. What's your name? Timo. 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 Your mummy calls you Timo. Okay, Timo. So I'm in love with Timo. Okay, so I'm in love with Timo. So we we know exactly. We we'll recognize everything I'm going to say. So if you're in love with Timo, you know you're completely blissful. You're full of joy. You can't believe you found this amazing being who's more delicious than you've ever known. You can't believe it. We know he looks delicious from the tip of his head to his smelly socks. We know that. You get my point? We know that. Everything about him is like divine. We know that. We know that. Okay. So, mainly what's happening now is it's 99.9% .9 attachment. <laughs> attachment. You see, this is where it's really tricky. Attachment, and in the, certainly in the in the text, and I know certainly in the Vajrayana text, which is not my business today here. There's this. This is coming from the Hindu tradition of all the prana and everything. There's these fascinating descriptions of the physical energies and the mental energies and how the inner should be linked. So there's something about attachment energy. This is from the Vajrayana or the Hindu business. That when it's the when the attachment energy is really strong, it triggers extremely delicious feelings of pleasure. So we can fight even attachment and pleasure, or love and pleasure. No, pleasure is a natural thing. Buddha's got these amazing methods to get us such pleasure we wouldn't believe it. It's called meditation. How boring, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything there. But meanwhile, the pleasure is, of course, what we want. And that's really the function of attachment. Attachment's job is to find the object such that when you have contact with it, it triggers pleasure. A good feeling. Happiness. And there's another whole discussion. We can't cover all that tonight. But with, certainly with Timo, we can say that some karma between us, and we've, I've fallen in love with Timo, which means I know a little bit about him, hopefully, and I know he's got some good qualities, hopefully. But basically, <laughs> he makes me extremely joyful. So, of course, and that's the point. The more, the Buddha's point is, this is very fascinating. The way the outside world, this is the way Lama Zoda puts it, the way the outside world appears back to us, back to us, is through the through the in the, the way they say it is in the aspect of what is in my mind. So basically, if my attachment glasses are wrong, that's how rose-coloured spectacles, isn't it? He will look completely divine. We know that. But this is the point about an opinion. If I see a cup and say, "What a pretty cup," that's a mild version of the same thing that's happening here. It appears to my eyes. It suits my style. It suits my opinions. So I say it's pretty. Well, he suits my opinions. He, he maybe is really kind to me. Do you understand? So it suits... I get My attachment is getting what it wants, basically, which means joyful feelings. So then he will appear <coughs> divine to me. We, we really understand this. So where's the love fit in? Right now, it's easy to love. It's easy to want him to be happy. If he makes me happy every second and I feel joyful, of course I totally have love for him. I really do want him to be happy. This is no question, isn't it? And I really do have compassion for him. When he has a headache, I really have, it really is genuine compassion, and it is genuine love, isn't it? But it's unstable. Look what happens when he gives me up for Soma, when before she was in love. <laughs> <laughs> when she was Giovanna. <laughs> Let's say he gives me up for Giovanna. We all know. How will he look? What glasses have I got on now? Angry glasses. I mean, this is not even funny, but it is funny. But we all recognise this. We don't join the dots. We don't join the dots. Suddenly, within a month, the man has got no fatter, no more grey hair, and I have a photo of him a month ago, and I have a photo today, and someone shows me Rubina, there's no difference, and I'll say, no, he's beautiful last week and he's disgusting now. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about making stories up, and this is exactly what we're saying. But we just don't get it. We don't join the dots because we're so absorbed in our opinions as always being right. You know? 
I mean, we all, this, is, this, this should blow our minds. This should prove the way the Buddha is saying ultimate wisdom, that nothing has an intrinsic nature. It's obvious. But we don't just join the, we don't join the dots. We fall into the trap of our own absurd opinions. So as long as he is making me happy, as long as he is doing what my attachment was, of course I'm prepared to love him. And of course I'm prepared to have compassion for him. We know this, you know. So they're, they're short-lived. So, so when we conflate attachment and love, it's evident they're not the same. So what does the love feel like? If, if we just say we do have a reasonable relationship and I've got some semblance of genuine love and compassion and we live together and he starts farting in the sheets instead of the toilet and doesn't put the toilet seat down, <laughs> and maybe I'm patient and maybe I'm kind and I maybe forgive him. Then sort of the attachment starts to settle down and gets less hysterical. We know that. But I still love the man, you know? That's because you, not because you're attached to him. You don't get happy because you're attached. You don't have a good relationship because you're only attached. That doesn't last. Because as soon as he stops doing what my attachment wants, I'm going to chuck him out or he'll chuck me out. But if it does last, it's because you've got access to love and compassion and kindness because they're empathetic, they're connected, they go beyond the absurd labels. You know, even when he gets fat and ugly, I'll still love him. You, know? <laughs> you understand my point? Attachment is this kind of ridiculous junkiness. It's so normal, so typical, it's running the show continuously, every second of the day, tragic for nice feelings, Every time we don't get nice feelings, we get annoyed feelings, and then we always blame the object. Then we always blame the object, isn't it? That's the other aspect. So basically, Buddha's saying delusions are ridiculous, absurd, distorted, exaggerated, neurotic, fear based, eye based, and are only the cause of your suffering, people. And I've found some methods to get rid of them, he says. It's just the hardest work we'll ever do. Because what, what I don't think, I don't think my attachment is the cause of my suffering. I don't think my anger is the cause of my suffering. I think Timo is, don't I? <laughs> you I mean, this is the part that's so primordial, you know. And all Buddha, I mean, Buddha's point is almost so simple. It's not moralistic. It's not kind of, it's not, it's not blaming. But we just can't hear it because we have all these overlays and all this addiction to believing that out, out there, that event, thing, smell, taste, touch, sound, person, that is the source of my happiness and that is the source of my suffering. And attachment is, is job is to manipulate to get it all to be just so and then to avoid all the ugly things. That's how we spend our lives, up and down like yo-yo. So this gets complicated when he starts beating me up because then we'll say, I'm allowed to be angry. So to hear the Buddha say, sorry, you're being the anger is the cause of your suffering, that's when, that's when it's very shocking. That's when it becomes a bit like a minefield. And he's still not disagreeing with that. He's still not arguing. He's still not saying your anger is... He's never saying... Ang he's not saying anger sometimes is a, is, is, is a cause of your happiness. And that's what, we, what, that's what we mistakenly conflate anger and compassion. Or anger and righteous kind of action, you know? So it's really quite kind of nuanced, this stuff. We've got to really think about it carefully because it's not easy on the face of it with all the assumptions we have. Because of course it's not appropriate he starts beating me up. It's really inappropriate, unless I ask him to. I mean, you get my point here. Unless <laughs> <laughs> we, we do karate together. You know? <laughs> do you understand? <laughs> but if, if it's not our agreement, then it is incorrect that he beat me up, and Buddha would agree that he broke the contract. It's wrong he, break, he beats me up, it's true. But the Buddha's making this point. He says, and this is where it's a minefield, because we think it's blaming victims. It's got nothing to do with that. There's a saying in Buddhism that if you can change something, I mean, please change it. If I can say, hey, Timo, quit it, baby, just stop. And if he does, well, I've solved the problem. <laughs> but what if he doesn't? And we know 99% of the time when bad things happen, as much as we wish they'd change, we know we can't change them. <laughs> we know this. So we've got to say, well, what's, what's the answer here? But already this advice is for a really reasonable, stable, self-respectful person. If we look at the rest of the universe, we're mostly, you know, when we're in the victim mode, that's when we can do nothing. That's when we're paralyzed, that's when we, are, that's when we become victims, that's when we, we, we become bullied, where people abuse and beat and harm. I mean, look at the universe, look at what people do to each other. There's no question that's monstrous, it's monstrous. So we're talking here about a person with some semblance of self-respect. I mean, if people come to me with their problems, I don't give a lecture about, you know, all that, you, you know, it's, um, it's, 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 you should change your anger. 
No. If a person's still in the victim mode, I'll give them a hug and tell them to go tell them to, you know what, to off, you know. <laughs> and we punch him right back, baby. Get some, get some strength here. Don't, I mean, it's, it's the worst cliche misconception of Buddhism. You've got to be this kind of passive, passive kind of pathetic person who sits in like a weep, you know. It's a, so monstrous to think that. When you see these terrible monks and nuns walk slowly up and down the street, you can be forgiven for thinking that. That's meant to be funny too. <laughs> <laughs> they do walking meditation. <laughs> I would explode into, I don't know what, if I had to do a walking meditation. <laughs> so anyway, the point of what he's making is this. The point is, if we can, it's, an inter- it's a powerfully internal job. This is a, there's a nice analogy, wisdom and compassion wings. Birds needs two wings. This is the one, this is the internal job. This is the nuts and bolts of what you do to yourself to put you together to become this self-respectful, reasonable person who can begin to feel that you have some semblance of control over your damn life. So you're not, you know, so that if we practice every day before the dramas happen, then we're ready for the dramas. If you can go to the mechanic when the wheels wobble, you'll be ready if they fall off. If you can deal with your mind and the small things, then you'll be ready when you get abused by somebody. You'll, be, you'll have enough courage and strength. I have to be sort of joke a bit here, but I know when I was a radical feminist, I was a Catholic first and loved God and blamed all the non Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> then I became a hippie and, and when I was 19 and discovered it was goodbye, God, hello, boys. And I, then, I blamed, then, I, then I was a hippie and I blamed all the, the, the people, the straight people. <laughs> then I came, went to London in one, I was about 23, and I, then I, got, I became a radical lefty communist and I blamed all the rich people. <laughs> then I got involved in supporting a group that supported George Jackson and the Soledad brothers and all the Panthers and things back in, in London in the early 70s, and I blamed all the white people. <laughs> and then I heard the word feminist. I thought it was feminist. I didn't even know the word feminist. <laughs> and I became one of them. <laughs> and then I heard radical feminist. Oh, I like radical. <laughs> <laughs> so then, of course, because I, I go to the extreme every time. So then I heard about radical lesbian feminists. <laughs> that was in London. And then that's when I came to New York. And I think I was moving towards my spiritual... Now, by that point, I'm sorry, I became a... What was that? <laughs> radical lesbian separatist feminist. <laughs> <laughs> I was serious. And that was only about the time I was in New York and I was doing karate in New York. I thought there was a point here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, blaming, blaming. Yeah, right. So went back when I was in London, sorry. Before I came to New York in 74, I was in London and I remember, I mean, we were serious feminists then. I don't know what's happened to the Me Too people, but we, we, we thought the men were stupid, but we decided we'd go and beat them up. So every time I, my policy, and I'm serious here, I don't know why people don't do it now. <laughs> Please listen to me. Yes, I'm being serious. Hey, I'm laughing. But I'm being very serious here. When we were ready to fetish, we were doing karate and everything, we made a decision that if any man said anything on the street, you'd walk up to him and you'd punch him and you'd shout at him and you'd abuse him. And I did. <laughs> every time. And every poor man was... I mean, I'm sorry, I like men now. It's all right. <laughs> but any man was completely embarrassed. I'd abuse him. I'd punch him in the, between the legs or in his face or whatever. And I made a, a strong political statement. Do you understand my point? Why don't women do that now? So just blame the, blame the silly men and get them to change. We've got to become strong. I mean, I, don't misunderstand my point here. <laughs> anyway, it was very funny though. One time, one fellow in London hit me back, <laughs> but I didn't mind him. I really respected him. He was the first one to do it. I, I, I admired him. But my point is that was much more <laughs> joke. I don't necessarily say to do that now, but I wonder why women in the Me Too movement don't have a, to become strong instead of always blaming the man. I mean, blame the man; they're ridiculous. But become strong and beat them right up. I mean, are we communicating or not here? Do you think I'm just being silly? You come to the wrong class. <laughs> I come to the wrong class, baby. <laughs> Please hear my point, okay? Anyway, back to, back to Buddhism now, okay? What was that? <laughs> There's more ways to skin a cat. That's what you told my grandmother, told me. There's various ways. With compassion, you see, you can do it. So anyway, okay, I can't stop. The point, now, what I think I'm getting at here is... In a way, it doesn't appear like it, but the Buddha's view is, is enabling us to become unbelievably powerful and confident people. And I think I'm serious in saying that. I really think I'm serious in saying that. 
If we are in the victim mode, which is typical, then every time the smallest thing happens, we're overwhelmed. So naturally, when the biggest things happen, we're completely paralyzed. So all Buddha's trying to tell us is, you know what, people? You have unbelievable potential to have unbelievable control over your body, speech, and mind. And, and by lessening attachment, lessening anger, lessening fears, lessening depression, how do you think you become more content, more self-confidence, more courageous, more fulfilled, less harmed by others? Surely is that not what we want, you know? But when we hear it in the Buddhist way, coming from Asia and Tibet, it sounds not like that. And that's a very interesting point I'm trying to make, I think. But where we're so addicted to always believing, you know, and we even say in our culture, I'm allowed to be angry. I'm allowed to be jealous. The Buddha's really simple point is it won't do you any good. I mean, a really extreme example here I'll tell you. And I find these extreme examples always very powerful ones. You know, someone mentioned before about working with people in prison. I was based in California since 94, and I remember I was editing our Buddhist magazine, and I got a letter from a young Mexican-American who told me he'd been in gangs since he's 11, in prison since he's 12, and in three life sentences from the time he was 16. And he read a Buddhist book and got our magazine name, so he wrote. And he wanted a Buddhist book. So he was... So I, I sent it. So within a year, I had like 40 people writing, you know. So we, this, this project's still going now. I stopped writing it <coughs> in 2009. So it was very powerful for me to work with people in prison in, this, in these shitholes, excuse me. I'm allowed to complain. I'm an American. Okay? I've got a passport since 2006. <laughs> do you know that 5%... America has... This, this United States has 5% of the, of the world population. But it's got 25% of the prison population. I'm sure you know that. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? Yeah. And don't let me get me go on about prisons anyway. Unbelievable, 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 unbelievable. So, um, working with people in prison, from my perspective of being a Buddhist, I mean, before that, when I was working with the radical lefties and kill the pigs and all that, and you know, when I was in the, as far as a, when I was a business before, that was the, here I am, 45 years later, working in the working in the same prisons in California. But this time, bringing the Buddhist Buddhist to them. But not because to make them more peaceful. It's not the point. It's to make them accountable, to make people self-reliant, to make people self-confident. I'm, I'm not trying to make people... I'm, of course I'm trying to make people feel peaceful, but peaceful means in charge of your life. Peaceful means not, at, not attached, not angry, not neurotic, not fearful, not ego-grasping, not panicking. That's what peaceful means. You can be busy and speedy and be peaceful. We have a cliché view that peaceful means slow and quiet and kind of wimpy. Not at all. Not, it's not like that. It's not like that. It's to have me strong in confidence, self-confidence, courage, clarity, and strength. They are qualities of a valid person. So why I found so moving with me, working with my friends in prison, Latino gangsters, my black friends, my poor white southern friends, like Kentucky boy in Kentucky. All the, I mean, I've never met a rich person on death row. Believe me. So my friend on death row, you know, um, Mitch. He's, he's not a psycho. He's with his friend Leaf. There were guns, there were drugs in the 1980s. Someone, got, someone died, so he's on death row. No money, poor, poor mummy, daddy working class, you know, poor southern mummy, daddy, nothing. No money, nothing. So 30 years later, done all these appeals, he's ready for his... I'm ready for that electric jolt, Ravina. So in those years, I couldn't... I don't have the money, I don't have lawyers, but I can help that man deal with his own reality understand his own mind, come to terms with his reality. If he could change it, fantastic. If I could give him a key, let him out, fantastic. But meanwhile, seeing as I can't, and these prisoners, they know they cannot change it. But what if you can't change it, what do you do instead? You change your mind. It's practical, not moralistic, not passive, not victim. This is the point, he's a happy guy. He's done all his appeal. Kind lawyers, as long as they could do all these kind people who offer this service, all these free lawyers around the world in this country, offering their services to kind people, but they can't catch up. The number of people are, you know, die in, in prison going crazy. He's ready for his electric job. Very f wonderful man. Another story I read years ago, I only read this woman. A hippie in, in Florida, nice white lady with white children, white husband, hippies in the 70s. And they're hitching in Florida, and she gets picked up by two guys. They got stopped by the police. The guys killed the police and blamed the hippies. So they're on death row in Florida. You're a cop killer. You're a monster. You're evil. 
She, her three children, their three children were given to her parents. The parents got killed in a car accident, the children lost into the system. I mean, you can't imagine the nightmare. Her husband executed the completely innocent hippies, you know. And she said, and this is what I'm saying here now, I think she did yoga and stuff, she wasn't a Buddhist. She said, at some point, I realized I couldn't change anything, but they couldn't take my mind from me. This is all Buddha's saying. Not be a wimp, not be passive, not put up with idiots. No, change your mind. Which means change your concepts, which means change your opinions about things. So she had, she had the astonishing intelligence and the will to do this. And she said, I decided, I'm not a prisoner, I'm a monk, I'm not in a cell, I'm in a cave. I mean, we love reading about these things. We're so moved by this courage. Can you only conceive of the courage? And I would call it emotional intelligence. I mean, look at the stuff that people blame us for. Nothing like that. And look at the pain we've had to go with for years. So it means this incredible work internally to rip your mind to pieces, to rip all these conceptual stories to pieces, to unpack and unravel them, and have the, and the conscious decision to change, to decide what we think. We are the one who's in power. We are in control. We are the boss of our own mind. That's really what Buddha's saying in our contemporary words. Who would not like to be this way, is the point. And then you have to, you know, my Tibetan friends, I mean, I have a friend, two stories from Tibet. In 2003, here, Richard Gere, as you know, a good Buddhist, he invited, invited to Dalai Lama, he invited people like me from California and 20 former Buddhists. Oh, sorry, former prisoners, all of whom had done some kind of work in prison, you know, meditation and stuff like that. It was a very moving day. It was a wonderful day. They met Dalai Lama and all the suffering and the struggle of blacks and whites, Americans, you know, I mean, sorry, black, white, Amer uh, white Puerto Rican, Mexican, cross-section of all Americans. It was a very moving day, hearing all their suffering stories. And then he also invited two young Tibetan nuns. So Tibetans, you've got to remember, it's been seven centuries since they were being Buddhist. 99 were Buddhist, 99% are Buddhist. A couple of Muslims, I think. The Catholics went to try and convert them in the Middle Ages, even translated the Bible. They couldn't get one Tibetan. <laughs> so they've known for 99 Tibetan Tibetans and to Buddhists, and that's all they've known for 1,000, 1,200 years. It's like completely their culture, you know. So the whole concept of karma, which is the Buddha's view, coming from the Hindus, which is an entire massive, fascinating world view dealt with in great depth in the literature, not some idiot thing made up by the hippies in the 60s. It's a huge philosophical worldview, and it's completely normal for those people because it's not our culture, it's quite shocking for us to hear it. That our consciousness goes back and back and back. Every millisecond, think, well, every millisecond of what we think and do and say programs our mind, basically, Buddha says, and produces our future experiences. So we are the creator. As the Dalai Lama says, karma is like self-creation. We don't need a boss, God, to make us, Buddha says. He's polite about it. We create ourselves, life after life. It's a pretty cosmic, amazing concept if we can hear it, the details of it. It's very fascinating. So what this brings is incredible accountability. That's why Tibetans never had much anger. Dalai Lama said he's very sad that more and more these days Tibetans are getting angry. And you listen to the philosophy of anger. It's how it, fits, it fits our culture. <coughs> How dare you do that to me? I don't deserve it. And I mean, it's because we don't have, we have a view that mummy made us in the womb and we didn't, we didn't ask to get born. It's not my fault and I didn't ask to get born. Well, of course you're going to get angry. But the Buddhist view is it wouldn't be anger if you had the view of karma. This is very serious. I mean, there's not much time to talk about it. What time do you have to finish? Um, 8.45. Oh, I know a whole hour. This is what I talk fast, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, the Tibetans are very fascinating. This is really the philosophy they've had for all this time. And it's in their bones, like it's in our bones that mummy, daddy made us, our mind is a brain, etc., etc. It's a very different philosophical model. So anyway, these young nuns were interviewed. They were telling their story to all the Americans. And there were tears. They'd been tortured, sexually abused for a couple of years, you know. And they weren't angry, and they were, they were quiet, and there were tears coming. And one of them said very quietly at the end, and of course, we had compassion for our torturers because we knew we'd harmed them in the past. Remember, this is their philosophical view. It's not shocking to them. It's real to them, you know. And of course, we and, and because we know that they will suffer unbearably in the future, 
Because the Buddha is saying basically all the positive actions we do program our mind that produce happiness. All the negative actions we do program our mind and produce and produce suffering. It's just a natural law, the Buddha says. No one runs it. It's not. It's not nobody judging. No one rewarding. It's a very very different view. Very fascinating view. Anyway, the other example was my friend Jigdo, another Tibetan. And this is what's interesting, you see, because we think, well, you think you did harm them before, then you deserve it. Why the hell should I have compassion for you? No. The Buddha says have compassion for everybody. We're all in the same boat. Suffering and being and causing suffering. Being happy and causing happiness. And we just go circle life after life, keep returning it like broken records, you know, until we do something about it. So this other story, my friend Jig Dong, this is like 30 years ago, he was, uh, his, was in, he was one of the first in... There's this first mini uprising in Tibet in 87. And all the young monks and nuns were the ones who were the, who were the radicals. They're the ones demonstrating, you know. So when we hear demonstration, we hear anger, don't we? Of course we do. But they don't have anger. It's very curious. So anyway, he was, they were all demonstrating. Then he got arrested. It was this 59. It was the first time it was really uprising. The Chinese communists slammed down, arrested. There were many killings and people arrested, blah, blah. He got arrested. He got tortured. He got released. He demonstrated again. Then his friend had his head blown off. Then he thought he'd better escape to Nepal. And then I met him there. And then he was telling me about all this. And since that time, his mummy had died or daddy had died, brother died, whatever. And he was sad. Again, tears. And I said to him casually, I said, Jigdor, do you ever get angry? And he laughed casually and said, angry, Rabina, what for? It's our own fault. Now, those words are too shocking for us, you know. This, is a, this really needs unpacking, this, this concept for us. Because the Buddhist Buddha's view is whatever arises in your life, you create it, babe. All the happiness, every second of your happiness. We, we have this hubris, we take the good for granted, and we deserve more of that one, but we don't deserve suffering. I mean, this is so natural for all of us, and it's very shocking. There's, there's no time to go into this. This takes years to process, actually, to make it part of your practice. But for these people, it's natural. He, it was, it was, but they were, they were demonstrating. So when you know something is right or wrong, you know, they know the reasons for it, but they're going to get out there and get their damn country back, please, because it's not correct that Chinese have taken it. So it's very interesting for us. We don't, we don't think this way, you know. What was my main point there? I've really lost the plot of it. So attachment and love, okay? Get back to these two. Attachment is this bottomless, deeply primordial hunger. Hunger. I don't feel I've got enough. And it's an assumption, and it's, and it's an assumption that I must get what I want. And it's an assumption that I deserve happiness and don't deserve suffering. This is quite shocking, actually, to think that we should think of anything else. But the, the Buddhist view is we, we create the causes. You know? We have to create the causes somehow. So this love, though, is conf we confuse it with attachment because we, don't, we just don't think this way. So love is a delight that, that, that he be happy. It sees him separately. It sees him up, out there, and I connect with him. I have empathy for him. I understand his mind. I want him to be happy, and I don't even want to make him happy. I have compassion for him. I want to help his suffering. And attachment is a totally self-centered, neurotic state of mind, I-based, fear-based, panic-stricken based, and they come together. So the more attachment, the, less, the more suffering, the less happiness, the more love, the more happiness, the more patience, the more kindness. That's the bottom line, really. So, but to distinguish between these is very hard because they come together automatically. And this is a major way. So even, ang like I said before, anger and compassion, for example. I remember that um, I'm not Luther King. It blew my mind. You could tell that man was a patient man. You know, you could tell he wasn't angry. He was, had this extraordinary personality. You know? And he said, nothing wrong. It's good to find fault. Look at the racism. Look at the injustice. Look at the suffering. But then you say, what can I do to help? That's compassion. That's not anger, that's compassion. Action is compassion, actually. But if it's just anger, it's impotent, it's raging, it's out, out of control, you're berserk, you, you've got no common sense, you go and cry it. You realize that the you don't, you know, and it's not only based on attachment, and it's not only based on anger, it's based on wishing to make things better. That's what's powerful. That's what's amazing. But we have to distinguish between these, because they all come together like a big soup, you know? And that can only come from contemplating, knowing your own mind well, going inside, doing a bit of focus. You know. Okay, are we communicating here with the And I think you ask me questions now. I said many stupid things, I'm very sorry. I hope I didn't confuse you. Because <laughs> if I said some useful things, please ask me questions. Okay, I'd like you to ask me questions now. Over here. 
here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Uh, my name is Alejandra, and thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, I want to, well, I don't know, it's like they kind of teach us when we're young that it's always good to have like goals and things that you want to accomplish. That's right, like you should have. Want to Absolutely, up. yes. But especially to me, yeah. uh, those goals and thoughts of expect, expecting things in certain way generate somehow anxiousness. That's right. And then That's right. what you're talking about. Exactly. Attachment. Uh, attachment. All the fears that come in. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so darling, the point is that there's a valid aspiration. I would like to do... Okay. Put it this way in a simple way. When it's attachment mostly, it's neurotic and fearful and neuro and exactly like you're saying, we get so much anxiety we, we, we can't cope. And because we hold on to it, we expect it, it's set in stone, it's very rigid, and we're always judging ourselves according to whether we've achieved it. But if there's, a, if there's like a valid basis for your decision, like to be a wiser, kinder, more compassionate person, then you can become a multimillionaire, I don't care, if you can help people. You know, so when it's, but it's really hard to see the difference between a valid, reasonable motivation for doing something, having a career, yeah. excuse me, Berkeley, helping other people, you know, whether you're mummy with seven children or whether you want to become a finance person, if it's not much attachment and if it's mainly to be a, become a better person, more wise, more kind, more useful, then you can be a benefit to the world. It's fantastic. But we've got to distinguish between these two in us. We've got to watch it like a hawk every second. It's not easy to see the difference. Do you see what I'm saying theoretically? You can't know the difference until we work on our mind. It's very difficult. Because it's a very specific kind of Buddhist, Buddhist way of saying it. Do you understand my point? So a similar way of putting it is, you know, okay, if you want to have an aspiration to go and make as many guns as possible, to kill as many people as possible, not that one. I mean, try to do things that are, useful, like, that are useful to others, helpful to others. That's common sense. We all feel that in our hearts, you know. Even if it's making toilet paper, you can still do it nicely and be kind to your workers. And, do you understand my point? Mm -hmm. I mean, but to do something that's useful, you don't have to go off and be like Mother Teresa. You can be simple and humble and help, help just but be something that's more based on love and compassion and kindness and generosity than on anger and attachment and self, and self and, and, and attachment. It's sort of obvious. If you think of those states of mind as neurotic <coughs> and I-based, then those, but things we do based on those will destroy us and not help others. The other stuff is be of benefit to ourselves as well as others. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. So are you talking about that attachment is basically <coughs> grasping, right? Like it's got a strong grasping. Yeah. All the neuroses have a very strong, frantic grasping mm -hmm. quality, exactly. So can you talk a little bit about the art of letting go? It, it takes time and it's practice. Sometimes, you know, like with Timo, let's say I'm wanting to go to a new one, I want to watch one movie. It's just something as simple as this. Don't wait for major life-changing decisions. Keep it start, start with the small stuff. So let's say I want to watch one movie and he wants to watch another. This is a tiny example. You agree? Do you agree? So I'm stuck on mine, right? I've got attached to my movie. So how do I let go of it? One, one example is, oh, let's watch your movie, Timo. Practice kindness. Do the opposite. There's one tiny, there's a million different ways to see it. But that's one tiny example. I mean, attachment is eye-based and love and affection is other-based. <coughs> But it's even then really hard to see because if you're attached to him loving you, you will let him have his way every time. And that's not cool either. So you have to know the difference between you wanting it your way and genuinely letting him have his way. But, if it's, but often this is, gets tricky because if you are the, like if, you say, you say, if you're say the victim in the relationship and he's the bully, you'll always be saying yes dear no, and that's not cool either. So you have to know where you're at in relation to that person where you are at in relation to that person. It's not just a set in stone answer. But if you're the mother and there's the child, you do not let them have their way. So it's, got a, it's a question of the relationship. Are you seeing what I'm saying, darling? Are you got a particular example in mind? About attached to a certain person, you mean? Yeah, yeah. But it, okay, can you see some suffering from it? Yes. 
uh, because attachment brings anger, it brings jealousy, it brings fear, it brings anxiety, mm -hmm. and, and also, especially, it depends on your personality, and, uh, as I'm indicating, it can also bring, it gives permission to the other person to bully you. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Well, you must be one of the good girls. Because there are good girls and bad girls, and bad girls, are, in my style, would have been to fight and get angry and walk out. <laughs> now I understand, I understand, classic one. You're the good, and so this is a really tough one, darling. This is a really tough one, it's really hard. It doesn't mean you have to beat the man up, or whoever he is, or whoever it is. No, but you've got, to find, you've got to find ways for you to become strong in you. Because it's only when you're strong and have confidence in you that you can say no. And it's, not, it's, it's easy to say the words, darling. It's easy to say the words. You can find a way. I think, you see, what's interesting here is very, this is very fascinating. One of the biggest, the deepest, most primordial attachments we have, more than sex, drugs and rock and roll, more than <laughs> money, power, and this is where it plays out in relationships. It's attachment to being liked. Attachment to being approved of. Especially if you're the good girl, you will do anything not to upset the apple cart. You will do anything to be seen as mummy's little helper and now, in this case, being the nice girl, the helper. And because you're terrified of this person maybe not liking you. That's the real fear. We often say, oh, I don't want to upset him. No. No. Because when you're in dynamic relationship, when you look at two dogs, and one's the big bully, but the, suddenly the victim becomes strong, what does the other guy do? He goes down to become the victim. So if you could, this is what I'm talking about, I make jokes about hitting the guys on the street, but it's the same point. As long as you feel like a victim, as long as you are fearful, there's other, you're giving power to this other person. You're giving power to this other person. Are you hearing me here? But if you can become strong, it'll, it'll shock the life out of him. <laughs> <laughs> It's not that easy, but know that deeply in your heart. But when we're the victim, we give all the power and we believe this person is powerful. But you're giving them that power, baby. Do you understand me? I do. I just don't know how to flip it. Well, I know, but I have to start with the thought. If you even understand the words I'm saying, make an aspiration, do a little meditation tonight, I'm going to have the courage to slowly express just start somewhere with the thought, darling, and see where it takes you. And then use methods, find help, whatever. But it, it, you can. Start somewhere. With the thought first. It's possible. Think it's possible. I can do it. And then be conscious of this. One step at a time. But it's at, and this is really important. And we all don't realise it. When we're, we're in the victim blank more, or in the victim to some degree, we give, the, to the, the per, we give power to the other person. I mean, it's a funny, it's just a silly example again from my, my crazy life. I got held up when I was here living in New York in 74. I was walking back home along the Lower East Side. I didn't know, I just arrived. I didn't know about people and nervous and guns and everything. And I got held up by a guy with a gun. And my sister was with me and she was still into stealing things. She comes, we come from this Irish bar and she had a glass of wine. And this dude comes up and puts a gun here. I, I, I mean, I didn't plan this, it happened. I'm giving you an example. So I remember, And he had a gun. And I remember getting, I started to get aggressive. I, I, and I showed like his mother. I said, who do you think you are? And I said, oh, that's a weird word, I said. I, how dare you? Who do you think you are? I said, how dare, I said, how come, you give me your money. You're as poor as I, I'm just as poor as you. It became this absurd nonsense, right? And my sister kept saying, hey, brother, have some wine. <laughs> <laughs> and she kept saying, give him some money. I said, no, you give me your money. Oh, God, I was so confused. <laughs> it is funny, but it's proving my point. It's proving my point. I know you can't do that overnight, and I was surprised. I didn't plan to do that. Do you understand my point? But I'm trying to make the point. When we can know that when we're in the victim mode, whether you're just with two girlfriends, 
this plays out with all sentient beings. Look at ants, look at dogs, everybody. This plays out with everybody. Because if someone's slightly more powerful, the other person gives in, you know? And especially if that's your habit all your life. But know this. Know you have, you don't have to be a bully. You don't have to shout. You don't have to punch. You just express yourself, you know? And not be scared. We've got to start by knowing it's possible and not to be scared. You've got to start somewhere. Are you with me? Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is familiar? Yeah. Thank you. Forgive me, man, I'm not being against men here. Please understand me. Are you with me? Yeah, but you are saying if somebody is like very controlling and abusive, it means that like they afraid actually even more. They what? They afraid even more. I'm not saying it as simple as that. I, what's so funny here, I had many siblings, where, and I were six girls and a boy, and I was the bully. I was like the bully in the family. So I understand men, I understand bullies. <laughs> I don't mean it like that, men. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I understand bullies. I know when I gave a talk to a bunch of men who were in, in San Quentin for beating up their wives and their girlfriends. The typical classic story. I remember mean, because I, mean, I was sympathising with them. They were all little wimpy little boys in tears, you know. I mean, men are human with little wimpy little tears. But they happen to be bigger and stronger and got... Never mind, I won't say any more. I mean, it's like, this is this karma between us. This classic one of this little small person giving power to the big person. I mean, all these men, the, the frustration, their own, because they're big and aggressive, yes, they were that. So when you're feeling frustrated and angry and you happen to have anger, you lash out. Yes, you do. And all I know is as a bully, there was nothing I would, I remember one particular girl who was a real victim. I wanted to rip her eyes out. Please try and understand me. Are we communicating here? Yes. I understand bullies. I was aggressive and I could not stand victims. I'd be so abusive, you know. So I understand that. But as soon as any person was strong with me, I was never there. I wasn't a bully. No way. No way, darling. Because all these delusions come from the same place. But aggression is pretty horrible because it hurts people. It is horrible. It hurts me. But it's coming from the same fears and same panic and same dramas. It's coming from the same hopelessness and same patheticness as all of us. But it smashes out. Do you understand that? Are we communicating people? Yes. 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 Thank you. Be brave, sweetheart. And how about making a decision to leave? I mean, you have to answer me. But this is something that's very, is it a relationship? Oh, I, I did, I left. Oh, and you went back again? No, oh, but that? I cannot fully let go emotionally. Well, there you go. Okay, yes. that's your problem then. Yes. So you mean you're not even with him? Mm -hmm. He keeps coming after you? He's left you alone? Yes. Well, darling, you haven't, he's got a different problem then. <laughs> well, you shut up and get on with it. <laughs> God almighty. Hoping he'll come back to you. Are you hoping it'll all I work do. out? I okay, so I listen, darling. How about this? This yeah. might make you feel better. Put it this way: the Buddhist perspective. If there is some karma still between you to go, it will happen <coughs> when it's right, but when you're bloody well ready, on your terms. But if it's not, then it will end. Never mind. Don't worry about it. Have courage. Have courage, people. And another simple way to put it: there's plenty more nice other guys out there, so tell them to bugger off. <laughs> Come on. But meanwhile, okay. All right. Any more questions? <laughs> what a funny night. Yes, darling. Go. Um, so, I mean, with regards to this power struggle between people, men and people. men and women, but people, <coughs> it's dynamics, well, it's people. I mean, I feel like it's it becomes slightly more complicated for me. Yes. When it's a your uh, child. Of course, now that's a very different discussion. That's a very very different discussion so because you got a role. Well, because you feel like. Well, the Buddhist view is attachment just makes you crazy. No, affection and responsibility and closeness can be there, but this over-exaggerating of the child's 
deliciousness and, and what mothers, are you the mother, I'm presuming, are you? I mean, she's <coughs> almost 20 year old, but, you know, oh. it's been there. She still lives with you? No, but we have this back and forth sort of power struggle. It's not... Darling, it's I think this is normal between point. mothers, isn't it? Anybody, mothers yeah. and children? <laughs> Okay. Do you think about it all the time? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so yeah, and you want, but that's good. You, that's yeah. close. But you do want her to be happy. Well, I think I want us both to be happy. No, forget that. I'm talking about love for her. You want her to be happy, and you want her to do the right thing. You want her to make the right choices. So where is the problem? She's 20. She's fully grown. She's left the house. So where's the problem? So speak it, then we can understand. I mean, I think the problem is that I don't know or trust that she makes the right choice. Okay, then back off, Mum. She's 20. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. If she was five, it's different. Even if she's 15. But if she's left the house and she's 20, you've got to learn to shut... First of all, just shut your mouth. Have a panic attack when she's gone. But absolutely, you've got to learn to completely, absolutely shut your mouth. <laughs> This is the most powerful practice you can possibly do. And it's easier than changing your mind, because it's much harder. You'll be in torment. I mean, I mean, you've got to shut your mouth. But how often do you talk to each other? And well, this is the, this is the struggle right now, is that we're not really talking to each other. Because she's sick of you telling her what to do and not trusting her. It's not so much that I'm telling her what but to do. But you don't trust her. Because there's been some complications that have led me to this point in time. So well, I can't answer that because it's too vague, but I, I can't know. say that. You, you know, don't have to speak your life out, it's okay. But it darling, be a long conversation. No, and you don't need all that. The, but the, the essence of it is, yeah. it's, it's not a love that makes you fearful. It's attachment. Attachment's eye-based, panic-stricken. Attachment only wants what I want and what you naturally want. What you're, I mean, it's natural. But, you're, right. but if you have the courage, one of the most powerful things, often with a child, they can kind of moan and complain to mum and then mum gives an opinion and then, then they get mad at her. So right. one of the most powerful ways to help her is never give an opinion about what she should do even if she asks you. Darling, I trust your wisdom. You'll make the right choice. There's nothing more infuriating for her if she's kind of a bit kind of, you know, not sure. But you've really got to go to the other extreme. Tell her she's got wisdom. You'll make the right decision, darling. I trust you completely. You've got to have that courage. You've got, okay, your heart's in your mouth. Watch like a hawk. Keep your eye on things, but you absolutely have to do that. I mean, we, surely you know from your own childhood. Yeah. You with me? And but tell her that. I trust your wisdom. You're fantastic. Even if you're scared, what choice do you have? Exactly. Especially because she's left home. You yeah. have no power. That's my advice. Yeah. Thank you. What else, people? Something else? Yeah, I mean, well, actually, yes, I, go. I have a question that's related to, to this question, yes. which is, what happens in a situation, you know, I'll just say, yeah. lately we're seeing more and more young adults that are living with their parents for, just for lack of a better term, for because, you know, I've heard it being used loosely, failure to launch, I'll just say, you know, they just haven't left. How, old, they, are these, how old are these young adults? 30. Give or take. And this is common now, you're saying? It's, it's it used to be common before, you know, mum. Pretty common. But now it's sort of like, and because that just, are you implied because the rent is too high or because they've not got together their life together, basically? Which one is it? It's hard to figure that out. I mean, you know, it's just, um, and I think that somewhere along the way that there's also a comfort that they find in being at home. But is there uh, an agreement the mother and the father are happy that they're home? No. Well, then what? So are you one of these people? I mean, I well, just the original, I can't answer. Yeah, well, so the situation is that my sister struggles with this a lot. So her daughter is 30 and still stays, her boy her, is still stays her, her son, yes. Do they have a job? Uh, no. Well, then they have to throw, her, throw him out. Is he mentally ill? No. Well, then he has to, they have to throw him out. It's very simple. It's very simple. <laughs> I mean, it's really very simple. You either accept that he's there and love him and treat him like your boy, like, you know, a mummy's do until they're 97, because mummies will always see their boy even when they're 97, or for their child's sake, if they're not completely crazy, okay, now we can go to six months, six months notice. Does he pay rent? No. Well, this is beyond disgraceful. <laughs> <laughs> they deserve everything they get, those parents. <laughs> it's very simple, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's outrageous. This is exact parents can be so manipulative. Parents are pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true, isn't it? So 
the dimension to this that makes it a little complicated is that this child is starting to go on a spiritual journey. I don't give a damn in hell. You're a girl who's not living and on a spiritual journey. I was to make it so precious. You're on a spiritual journey. Earn their own keep. They can be spiritual. Thank you. Spiritual journey. <laughs> and they're all the more capable of getting a job. Excuse me. This is shocking. I can't believe it. Mothers are pathetic. Oh. Makes it more complicated. Less complicated. Are we communicating here? Please. Um, but it's clear they're not going to do it, right? No, no, they've tried. I mean, they've tried done what? <laughs> they can't try to throw him out. They throw him out. <laughs> <laughs> give him notice. I mean, are they rich? I mean, you know. Do they you give him a little bit of money, went to place for him, and then after six months, he has to take over paying the rent. You help him, you push him forward, and he can do his little spiritual practice in between working. <laughs> <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Please, I can't believe these things about parents. I get. To, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Are we communicating people here? Yeah. Your mother's dare to say something. Yours Thank is okay, you. but be Thank brave. Get yes. my point. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Yes, darling. Yes, you sweetheart. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yep. So for me, so yep. I've been living in Manhattan for 15 years. Yes. Where my like neurotic emotions play out. Your neurotic emotions play yes. out. Well done, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you, darling. I understand. I can't, like, this whole term, like, what is the Buddhist view? What, darling? What is the Buddhist view? On the Buddhist view would be if you can change it. I mean, this is not cliché. It's profound. I'm going to discuss it. This is, this is the, the essence of all of our problems. If you can change it, change it. But if you can't, so have you tried to have it changed? Have you tried to Well, that's the thing. Like, it's like, where is the line between, like, healthy Problem solving? No, no, sorry, you're not just not your, I mean, what do you mean problem solving? Well, what do you mean? You, you might in like a effective way communicate with somebody, well, right? Well, that's what you've got to do if you, that's part of your job. If you've got this. Where's the line between that and like you're now being controlled by your desire to control your No, desire. don't get too caught up. Just help them <laughs> stop their noise, help them clean their house. So you have got to solve the problem. It's better to solve it more peacefully and kindly that they know that you're, you, you respect them than to bully them. That's clear. No. <coughs> But have you tried that yet? I'm I'm but accepted. have you tried they that? They don't realize how angry I am. Have you tried I'm that right. yet? Yeah, I have. Well, yeah. Well, no, I don't think you have. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> darling. <laughs> what, My new roommate. I love her. She's wonderful. So she's the one who's the problem. Right. Well, I see. No, wait a minute, darling. Let's just get clear here. Wait. Stop. 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 I can't answer generally. Let me be specific. No, I'm being direct. Are you being talking really about your next door neighbors or the girl in your own no, apartment? Right now it's my, that's, I'm telling you, it's a long history of like it's one thing, it's not. Like, so it's like definitely I'm the consist the common denominator. What, darling? Like I'm the common denominator. So it's people who come and you live in your house. No, like it, in the past it's been a neighbor, but now it's like a. Okay. Well, so then there's some karma you've got to have people annoy you. So yeah. obviously it's a practice for you to give up your anger. It's an easy way to put that's, it. That's what I'm, yeah. Well, that's clear. But then it's hard work, isn't it, darling? Very. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Yeah. But what about your one who's living with you? Can you get her to change her behaviour? I don't know. I don't have you tried? Have you yeah, asked I her? Did try. I did try. Yeah. But have you tried nicely? I tried nicely. But and she doesn't like change. Not having control. She doesn't her, change. Go, no, darling, you're saying too many things. She doesn't change, is what you're saying. No. Have you not tried? So far, no. How would you like her to be that she isn't? Um, well, right now, like, the towels smell. <laughs> 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 so this is where, darling, this is where, if you can change something, then how about offering to wash her towels? I, I would do that. Well, then do it. Okay. Help her. You see, the point, the point is, darling, as you're just pointing out beautifully, if you have got a tendency to be angry, and I do understand, that's my second name, you'll always find something else. Right. By doing what reinterpreting your neighbor. I'm not trying to be sarcastic here. No. It's practical stuff. This is not holy. It's really, really practical. And it's not a joke either, because I do understand how you feel. And living in this intense city with a million other things around, I mean, we're all, no wonder we're going to really kill each other. It's true, isn't it? And you can't just leave and go to the country. Then you get, then you get annoyed with the birds. <laughs> <laughs> We're communicating a little bit, right? So do a bit of both. Try and find a way to 
you know, and then <coughs> from this, though, try and don't. I mean, if you can be kind, does, do, do you like the girl who lives with you? Yeah. You don't. You like her, and she likes you. Yeah. Well, then just she offer to do the like laundry. Her. Offer to do the laundry, and I'll, I'll wash your te- too, darling. And then she might, you know, I just and you make. And, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Come on. I'm going to try and be happy with what you have got. What do you think? Are we communicating? Mm-hmm. I hope so. Who else? Yes. And yes. Where? Oh, yes. And yes. And where? Yes. <laughs> and yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, you next. Come on. I'm coming, I'm coming back. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm Helen, and I know you talk about this kind of cycle of attachment and aversion, and so when you try and break that initially, there's a lot of pain that comes up. Definitely yes, massive. It's the hardest job we'll ever do, darling. So what, I guess, there's two questions, like any general recommendations on how to, pro- the most kind way to process and deal with that pain, and then is there a sort of, and sometimes it becomes overwhelming, do you just say, okay, I'm just going to sit with this attachment and visit it later? No, I mean, it's, on, it's like everything is like ongoing. If you're trying to learn, you know, run, run a race, if you're trying to learn to lose weight, if you're trying to learn to play the piano, if you do, everything's a learning process. So you've got to first know what you're trying to learn, and then you do a little bit every day with patience and humility, and then you look back and you'll be surprised that you've made some progress. Is that quick fix, though? Sometimes this is forced upon us, like if you're in love with somebody, they cheat on you and you, they leave you very young a virgin, you're thrown in the deep end. And that can be very cathartic experiences. So make the most of those and really try to take care of yourself and, and really, because I mean, if you didn't have a chance, you wouldn't suffer. This is a literal point. So that, and this is often happens to us, where it's blind as bad, so you wait till the damn thing happens, and then it's a bit late, you know? So just work on it a bit every day. This is why having some simple kind of meditation practice five minutes in the morning to set yourself up on the right track, to see your mind, check things, just notice what you're thinking, adjust your thinking, give yourself a little lecture every now and again. Simple, simple, simple stuff. I think for me, it was specifically what like, I lost my mom very suddenly. Yes. And so for me, there's years where I feel like I'm fine, like I'm not in pain, and then it just hits me. With your mom still? Out of nowhere. When did yeah, she so die? What's that? When did she die, darling? It'll be eight years ago. And you still feel a lot of loss. It, it'll come and go. <coughs> it's it's